Well, hello there. How's it going, everybody? Welcome to another episode of D&D Optimized, the show where each week we take a deep dive into one, sometimes two, character builds for Dungeons & Dragons 5e, and we theorycraft about them, we crunch numbers, and basically just try to create a character that's uh, really powerful and fun to play in-game for the role that we've chosen for it. So, my name's Colby, and I'm your host, and really happy to have you, so thanks for being here. If you enjoy creating characters in D&D almost as much as actually playing the game, or maybe more, just don't tell your dungeon master, um, then welcome home, because this is where you belong, so thanks again for being here. Um, as always, if you enjoy the content, I do hope you'll give me a like and a subscribe and a comment and and maybe even consider joining the channel. Um, it's not particularly expensive, but I do give um, a write-up kind of cheap sh cheat sheet uh, to, to members, at least those who subscribe at the $2 level. That's currently, anyway, as of this recording. It's really a way for you to, I guess, support me and my friends and help us to uh, add more and better content. So anyway, speaking of more and better content, um, I know I've been mentioning this a lot, but just FYI, we do have um, our session zero for our new campaign coming out tomorrow. So be on the look for that. Um, it's going to be called Tales of Anaria session zero. So yeah, watch for that. And then next week, uh, we'll have episode one up and ready to go. So I hope you guys enjoy it. We're super excited about it and uh, just anxious to, to not only start a new campaign in a homebrew world, but share it with all of you. So many of you have been asking for us to, to record our games and, and post them, so so we're going to do it. And uh, I hope that it's well received. <laughs> As for the episode this week, fine. If you guys aren't going to vote for Triant Monk and I to do a Mercy Monk, then I'm just going to have to do it myself. <laughs> you, you all knew this was coming, right? Um, yeah, I've, I've been looking forward to doing yet another Monk build because... As many of you know, I love them. They are they are a true love of mine in uh, in Dungeons and Dragons. But but uh, more to the point, ever since our 10K gauntlet that we did um, to celebrate uh, our our 10,000 subscription subscribers, um, I have been maybe even more in love with burst damage characters than I than I previously was. I think um, for those who watched. I think you'd probably agree that the the needler character, um, okay, another card uh, played by my friend Scott, was um, probably the MVP in in that gauntlet. It's just it's really hard to deny the strength of a character who can completely eliminate or almost completely completely eliminate a single enemy right out the gate, right? Even if their sustained damage per round DPR is maybe lower in subsequent rounds. Going for a Nova damage or a burst damage build, we use those terms interchangeably, right? Uh, it just really does a lot to help even the odds for your team uh, in, in a fight. And of course, most of you probably are saying, duh. <laughs> um, but if you know me, you know that most of the builds that I've done thus far on this channel tend to focus on what I like to call sustained damage per round, right? So. And when I say to sustain damage per round, what I basically mean is damage that you can do pretty reliably, turn after turn, at least for an entire combat encounter, right? Without spending just tons and tons of resources every single turn in order to do that damage, right? High level spell slots, etc. And admittedly, I do still love that. I, I still do love finding um, good sustainable damage per round builds uh, just because I really like good numbers and I really like dependable, um, consistent numbers most of all. I'm a Taurus, what can I say? Um, but the one thing that I love maybe more than numbers when it comes to D&D, monks. Um, I just, I love them. Every time I make a new character for a new campaign, I just, I just want to make a monk. And that's just me. I love everything about them. Um, I love, I love the, I love the kung fu master martial arts expert. Your body is a weapon thing, and all of the cool stuff that comes along with that. Um, the only thing that I don't really love about monks is how underpowered they are. <laughs> 
Um, the thing with monks is trying to build them as a sustained damage per round character, which I have tried to do a couple of times now. Um, it just feels like you're kind of lying to yourself, right? Um, or that I guess I'm lying to you, maybe. I don't know. Uh, in order to, to truly compete on a sort of sustained damage per round basis, um, you kind of have to spend at least one key point every turn, I feel like, as a monk. And even then, sometimes you might not quite get up to sort of the best damage dealers, right, in the game. And so, unless you are getting a lot of short rests, and you're a pretty high level monk, and or your combat encounters are very short, and over in, you know, three or four turns, you can't really assume, it's difficult to assume that you're going to have key to spend every single turn, right? So, I think the thing that makes the most sense, sort of bringing these two ideas together, my love of monks and burst damage, I think the thing that uh, makes the most sense when looking at monks for a damage build is to focus more on burst damage. It's a lot easier to assume that you're going to have at least one or two key points in a fight uh, for one big round of burst damage, right? So. When I was looking at the Mercy Monk, because for those who don't know, Triant Monk and I, Chris, uh, we did a collaboration video last week. Okay, here we go. Um, and before we did that, we, we, we put a poll up asking what people wanted us to do the build on. We were each gonna, we were gonna take one subclass and do uh, each do a build, right? We did the Rune Knight, it was a lot of fun. It was well received, thank you for all your positive feedback. One of the options was Mercy Monk and it came in last place. <laughs> hmm. And so anyway, I was like, I, I was hoping it would win. It didn't. And I just said, well, I'm going to do it then. I'm just going to do it myself. So when I was looking at the Mercy Monk, I, I decided to approach th approach the Mercy Monk from that perspective with, with the goal of uh, maybe trying to, trying to create a good burst damage build. So I was looking for nice features that provided some really great damage benefits for at least one round that complemented the monks, and particularly the mercy monks' uh, inherent features. Ideally, you know, things that would reset on a short rest, for example, um, if possible, because that's when the monks' key points reset, so that at least you can feel confident that you'd be able to do this level of damage, this big sort of nova round, uh, once per short rest, right? The, the great thing about the mercy monk, though, is that even if you do try and build them for damage, or another role, I suppose, maybe you try and make them a tank, I don't know, that would be interesting. Um, but regardless, no matter what, you still are going to have some nice support features, particularly in the form of you know a, a reliable, dependable heal and later a cure um, that, that can really help your allies, as well as some debuffing of enemies and things like that. So whether you want them or not, you have some good support features and and the thing that i love about that is it just it it sort of you can't help but create a fairly well balanced character or at least a character that has some variety in the role that they can play and the things that they can do and that ultimately is something that i really ended up loving about this particular subclass and and the way that i ended up building it i think it would be a lot of fun because it would give us a lot of variety of play style in game now, before I jump into the build, I, I do need to say this. Usually, when I multi-class a character, which is almost every episode, <laughs> to some of your dismay, uh, I, I usually like to throw in ideas, right? Like roleplay ideas for, or story reasons for why you're multi-classing. Well, you started out as class X, but now you're going into class Y, and maybe it's because of this, or maybe it's because of that, or, you know, come up with a good reason for that. And I've, I've had some comments lately, some, some of you say, that's great, I love these suggestions. And then others will say uh, things like, you know, I don't know that you necessarily need to come up with a great story reason for why you're taking a multi-class. You know, you, you might instead just consider your build as its own sort of class, right? You know, you're not a fighter X, warlock Y, monk Z. Um, that was a spoiler alert for this episode. Uh, you are a dark chi warrior right or a martial energy healer or whatever right you you're you're creating sort of your own unique class and you don't need to justify bouncing back and forth between a fighter and a monk and a warlock and then back to a fighter or something like that because this is just the progression of your kind of customized 
character class that you've created for yourself. And I really like that. I think it's a I think it's a valid um, option for for role play purposes, for story purposes, to say you know I'm not really a fighter, or I'm not really a monk as you might think of a monk traditionally. Um, I'm I'm sort of this you know more fighter heavy kind of battlefield leader you know that happens to have a a, a pact with another worldly being uh, chi warrior i don't know you know come up with come up with uh, with your own name if if that interests you um and and if you think that it helps you sort of get into your character and identify with your character and even i guess justify if you feel that you need a justification um for why you're taking you know dips into other classes. So that's what I'm going to kind of go with this time. I'm not going to try and come up with a, a story reason every single time we maybe go with a different class at a different level and things like that. I'm just going to say, you know, come up with your own reason and your own name for this particular multi-class, I'm not going to say multi-class heavy compared to other builds that I've done. It's not that bad, <laughs> but multi-classy uh, Mercy Monk that we're going to build. So preamble over. Without any further ado, I present episode 39, The Mercy Monk. Let's jump in. All right, at level one, um, we're going to start off our class will be a fighter uh, for level one. We're, we're going to want a few things from fighter and take a few levels in fighter eventually. Um, I think for that reason, we might as well start there because the level one fighter is really strong. I want the proficiency in... Uh, your constitution saving throws that will help us with our uh, with our concentration checks later. Plus, picking up an important fighting style is nice, and starting with 10 hit points is uh, is, is hard to argue with, too. So, um, we're going fighter at level 1. As for the race, probably need to go half-elf. We, we were stat hungry, and we want elven accuracy. So, we don't have uh, better choices, I don't think. Obviously, you can do what you want. But uh, I would say pick your favorite half-elf variant. Um, I'm probably going wood elf, I think, because uh, as a wood elf, we're told we can swap skill versatility for fleet of foot or uh, weapon training, elf, elf weapon training, or mask of the wild, and I want that fleet of foot. So I'd be giving up, you know, skill proficiency, but I love having that extra five feet of movement speed that fleet of foot gives you as a wood elf. Monks as a class have a higher move speed innately than any other class, and that's great. And I love just sort of adding to that in a couple of different ways, just to ensure that we can really get all over the battlefield uh, when we need to. Our support features in particular are going to be dependent upon us being able to touch our allies a lot of the times. And so if they're clear across the battlefield and you've used some of your movement to get up into melee range and make some attacks, you know, it, it'll be nice to have a lot of extra move speed to get over to an ally that may need your assistance. As far as abilities, assuming point by, as always, uh, we're going with 15 dexterity plus two for our weight, our racial, 15 wisdom plus one, um, 13 charisma plus one, and then a 12 constitution. Um, I know, 12 constitution is, is painful. So not for the faint-hearted, this build, and definitely a weakness of the build. I do imagine, especially later, kind of getting in and out of combat a lot. So hopefully you're not sort of in the front line all the time. Uh, that might help us and be an important tra tactic and strategy uh, when you're actually fighting in combat. As for equipment, great thing about being a monk, you don't really need anything. You just need clothes um, and, you know, some sort of basic necessity. So if it were me, I would probably go gold buy and just get your basic necessities and pocket the rest for, uh, for later. Start your savings early. Now, if you are starting this game at level one and you're a little worried about surviving level one, because you're going to be a really terrible level one character if you're a fighter with an eight strength, um, and you're making unarmed strikes, which we're going to be doing. Uh, so yeah, if you're if you're concerned about l surviving level one, you know, go ahead and get chain mail and a shield and a rapier because you've got your high dexterity, so you could use a finesse uh, weapon, and and that'll get you through level one just fine. Um, otherwise, you know, just get yourself some clothes and a backpack and and pocket the rest. But uh, okay, as fighters, we also get second wind at at level one, which is nice. 
Um, you can heal yourself for a d10 plus your fighter level. It's not a ton early on. It's it's pretty significant. Doesn't scale very well, but for right now it'll be a, a nice to have. And then you've got uh, your fighting style. So we're going to choose the unarmed fighting style. Probably not too surprising. Right now we're told that um, you know we we use our strength obviously to make unarmed uh, unarmed strikes. And um, if we don't have any weapons in our hand or a shield, then our unarmed strikes are a d8 plus our strength bonus, right? Plus to hit and plus to damage. Um, if we had a high strength, that'd be great. We have a terrible strength, so we're not going to be actually getting much out of this for right now. Um, so again, like I say, I hope you can survive. <laughs> it, will, it will be fantastic once we start taking some monk levels here in a moment. Um, but, uh, and, and also importantly, thanks to Tasha's, we can swap this fighting style out later once our, um, once our unarmed strikes as a monk innately become a D8, once we get enough monk levels, right? So you also do get from the unarmed fighting style a D4 of damage to a target that you have grappled. We're not planning on doing that, so you're probably not going to benefit much from it, but just so you know. At level two, you know, it is really tempting to just just go into fighter two and pick up that action surge. I know, um, action surge is amazing. But if we do that, then it's going to be really hard not to just go fighter three for our subclass, and then we're going to want fighter four for the ability score increase, and then we're going to want five for the extra attack. And where does it all end? So um, we're just going to start getting monk levels now. Um, do what we came here for. Start building up our key pool, uh, key point pool, etc. At level one, as a monk, because we're going monk one, we get unarmored defense, which is nice. It allows us to add our dexterity modifier and our wisdom modifier to our armor class as long as we're not wearing armor or using a shield. So that's, you know, plus three for dex, plus three for wisdom. So we're at a 16 AC right now. Not terrible, not great, um, but, you know, it's, a, it's decent and it'll get better. Um, we also get martial arts. Martial arts is awesome. Um, so when we take the attack action to make an attack with an unarmed strike or a monk weapon, and again, monk weapons are basically simple weapons, or if you're using Tasha's, you can sort of touch one weapon that you're proficient with and make it a monk weapon, but, you know, we're just basically going to be using our fists. Um, so anyway, when you make that unarmed strike, we can, as a bonus action, make another unarmed strike. Similar then to two-weapon fighting, right? Now, since we're told that if we're not wearing armor or using a shield or using weapons that aren't monk weapons, we can use our dexterity instead of our strength modifier for our unarmed strikes to hit and to damage. And because we have the unarmed uh, fighting style, we now get to use our dexterity for, you know, punches and kicks, right? And they are a d8 of damage, which is really pretty good. I mean, at this point, we're sort of the equivalent of you know, a character who's taken both the two-weapon fighting style and uh, the dual-wielder feat, essentially, at least for, for damage purposes. Of course, you could, if you wanted to, you know, use, say, a quarter staff, and you could, you could use a quarter staff. It's got the versatile property, right? So you could use it with two hands, and it's a D8 as well. So you could make your attack with that quarter staff and then make an unarmed strike, you know, kick or even, you know, let go and make a punch or whatever. Um, also for a d8, it, it kind of just depends on how you like to flavor it. I just, I always prefer just using my body. That's going to come back to haunt me, isn't it? At level three, we are a monk two, and we get key points. Ah, key, that most controversial of monk features. So key is great. Um, it, it, it fuels all of our most important monkish abilities, right? Most people who argue that monks are underpowered, including me, would argue that one of the biggest problems that they have is their lack of key points. Um, you gain one per level, so here at level two we have two, and then we gain one more every time we level up, right? And although they reset on a short rest, we use them for a lot of things. And those things are neat and powerful, potentially, uh, but they run out quickly. And a monk without key points is a pretty weak character, <laughs> at least for damage purposes, if nothing else. So, 
you know, there are a lot of people out there who have done a homebrew kind of variant monk, and if you can get access to one of those and convince your dungeon master that it's balanced, more power to you, you'll be in a lot better place probably. Um, but we are trying to work within rules as written, so we are going with a raw monk. Now, you can use your key at this level for three things. Thing number one, patient defense. As a bonus action, you can spend a key point to take the dodge action. So um, it's expensive, but it does give your enemies uh, it does give your enemies disadvantage on attacks against you until your next turn. So it's pretty nice in a pinch if you you know are really needing that extra defense. We could do step of the wind. So with that, you spend a key point, and now you can disengage or dash as a bonus action. So kind of like the rogue's cunning action, but worse, because you can't hide and it costs you a resource. <laughs> Still, nice when you need it. But most importantly for us, flurry of blows. So you spend a key point, and then when you take the attack action, you, as a bonus action, can make two unarmed strikes. For flurry of blows, it costs you a key point, but you get that extra extra unarmed strike in there, which is nice. So here, you know, at, at as a level three character, we could action, unarmed strike, Bonus action, spend a key point, two more unarmed strikes for three d8 attacks plus our dexterity bonus. It's pretty good. It's pretty good damage. Um, it unfortunately can only be done twice per short rest at this point because we're only a monk level two, but still, uh, it's, it's pretty good damage. We also get unarmored movement. So when we're not wearing armor or a shield, our move speed goes up by 10 feet, which is always useful. Uh, so if we went Wood Elf, Half Elf here, our move speed is 45 feet at level 3, and that's pretty cool. At level 4, we are a Monk 3, and we get the Deflect Missiles feature. Monks get so many cool, fun features that you really only get to use once in a while. But when you do, you feel really awesome. So, as a reaction, you can deflect or catch a missile when you're hit with a with a ranged weapon attack. You can deflect or catch the missile, and you reduce the damage that it supposedly does to you by d10 plus your dex modifier plus your monk level. So as long as you have your reaction up, it's pretty rare that you'll take much damage from, uh, from a ranged weapon attack. Now, if you reduce the damage to zero, you can spend a key point and essentially not only catch the arrow, but redirect it, right? And back at the attacker or at somebody else, which is super cool, super awesome, not very powerful, probably not a great use of a key point, uh, especially now when you don't have very many to spare. You have to, the, the missile has to be small enough to hold in your hand. But yeah, again, it's just a d4 of damage because it's your martial arts die, which for us is just a d4. So I wouldn't do it unless you really need to. There, there was actually a commenter in one of my one of my earlier monk build videos um, that told this story that was totally awesome. And they were in prison and they were sort of verbally taunting the guard to where the guard finally got so upset with them that they made like a crossbow attack at them. And of course this character caught and then redirected the arrow back to the guard, killed him, and then they were able to sort of get their keys and get themselves out of prison, which is so cool. Monastic tradition. Okay, so we get our subclass as a monk level three and we're going way of mercy, obviously. So a few features here. We get implements of mercy. Um, that gives us proficiency in insight and medicine. So maybe make sure that you don't get proficiency in those things uh, when you're building your character and taking your background and things. Oh, and the herbalism kit. So that's nice. You also gain a special mask that you supposedly use for features in this class, but then the mask is never really mentioned again. So get out of here, mask. <laughs> I'm a kung fu master, not a plague doctor. Unless you want to be a plague doctor, of course. Or wear a mask that looks like a butterfly. You should totally do that, if that's, uh, if that's your jam. So, we also get Hand of Healing. Hand of Healing is one of my favorite things about the Mercy Monk. So, you can heal. Period. Uh, you don't have to take a feat for it. You don't have to take a spell for it. So, even if you're trying to build this class as a burst damage, dealer, like I've said we're doing, uh, you can still bring up companions who go down, and and even more cool stuff later, so long as you have key to spend, of course. So as an action, here's what Hand of Healing does. As an action, you spend a key point, you touch a creature to heal them for your martial arts die, which is only a d4, but it's going up soon. 
um, plus your wisdom modifier of three for us right now for an average of 5.5 hit points at this level. Not amazing. So yes, you know, I'd probably only use this when a when a an ally goes unconscious, right? And you can pop them back up. Um, but definitely uh, nice to have. Even better, when you spend a key point to use Flurry of Blows, right, giving you two unarmed strikes as a bonus action, one of those unarmed strikes can instead be this Hand of Healing. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, you can use your action and your bonus action to do damage to the enemy and then still, you know, get a heal off uh, on an ally. Now, keep in mind, of course, that you are still going to need to touch that ally in order to heal them. And if they're on the other side of the room and you're fighting, you know, uh, someone in melee range, if you're going to move over, you're going to probably take an opportunity attack and, and potentially take some damage uh, by doing so because we're not going to be able to spend a key point to disengage um, with our Step of the Wind feature because we've used our bonus action to do Flurry of Blows, right? So keep that in mind. Um, of course, we will have options. Well, maybe you've killed the target, but um, you can later on, you can stun them. Um, there might be a feat that we'll take that will help us in this regard. So uh, we'll, we'll have options, but just be aware. The other feature uh, that we get at level three as a mercy monk, sorry, is hand of harm. So once per turn, when you hit a creature with an unarmed strike, it doesn't necessarily have to correlate with flurry of blows. It just has to be an unarmed strike, right? You can spend a key point to deal extra necrotic damage equal to your martial arts die plus wisdom modifier. So just like the hand of healing, right? Wish it were dexterity, but wisdom, I guess, makes sense. Of course, there's no reason why we couldn't add this on top of our flurry of blows, so long as you had the key points to spend. So you could action and then bonus action flurry of blows for two more unarmed strikes, and then whichever one of those hits, the first one that hits probably, apply for it for an additional key point, your hand of harm. So that'd be spending two key points, but it's it's a decent amount of damage. And of course, we could also stack this with the hand of healing. There's no reason why we couldn't, so far as I know. So we could action unarmed strike, bonus action for a key point flurry of blows, and then you know just make unarmed strike action, unarmed strike, the first flurry of blows attack. If either of those hit, apply our hand of harm, and then for the second unarmed strike, heal somebody, or heal ourselves even if we really needed to, right? So it's nice to have options. So at this early point in your character's career, your burst round of damage looks like this. Make, you take your action, make an unarmed strike, bonus action, spend a key point, flurry of blows for two more unarmed strikes. So each of those do a d8 plus three for our dex mod, right? For a total of three d8 plus nine. Um, and then the first time you hit, you spend a second key point for your hand of harm, which is a d4 plus three. Um, that's an average of 28 damage at level 4, assuming every attack lands, of course, which it won't necessarily. But at level 4, I mean, 28 damage on average, that'll most likely take out most of the enemies that you're, that you're fighting in a single round, which is great. At level 5, we are a monk 4. We get slow fall, and this is just another super awesome monk feature. Um, as a reaction... When you're falling, you can you can use your reaction to reduce the damage that you take by five times your monk level. Now, you take 1d6 of damage for every 10 feet that you fall, right? So on average at this level, you would have to fall 60 feet uh, before you took any fall damage at all, which is super cool. And you should always be looking for cliffs to jump off as long as they're 60 feet or less. Um, you also get an ability score increase or feet, of course, and we're going to take Elven Accuracy. So Elven Accuracy is great. It lets us bump our Dexterity by one or another ability score, but we're going Dexterity. So our Dexterity is 18, which is fantastic for our damage, for our armor class, for our initiative, uh, and other things. And then, of course, we get that sweet triple advantage um, that I love so much. So again, for those who don't know, uh, when you have advantage and you're making an attack that's dexterity based or wisdom or intelligence or charisma uh, and you have the elven accuracy feat then instead of rolling 2d20s basically you get to roll three um, so that just really improves our hit chance on enemies as long as we can get advantage on our attacks so we're gonna have to find some ways to do that 
and we will starting at the next level. So at level six, we are a monk five. We get extra attack, hallelujah. And so now when we make the attack action, we can attack twice. Um, we also, our, our martial arts die goes to a d6, which really for us only means that our hand of healing and hand of harm go up from a d4 to a d6, right? And then we get stunning strike. Um, this is, I think you could make the argument that this is the monk's strongest feature, uh, but it's also famously unreliable, <laughs> which makes monk lovers everywhere super sad. So when you hit another creature with a weapon attack, and remember, as per the Sage Advice Compendium, um, unarmed strikes are considered to be weapon attacks, like a melee weapon attack. Um, so when you hit a creature with a weapon attack, you can spend a key point to attempt to stun them until the end of your next turn. The end of your next turn. That is huge. Not the beginning, right? Um, stun targets are incapacitated, so that means they can't take actions or reactions, and it interrupts concentration if they're concentrating on, on a spell, among other things. Um, they can't move. They automatically fail strength and dexterity saving throws, and attack rolls against them have advantage, or in our case, of an accuracy, triple advantage, right? Now, this is so very strong. Inflicting stun on a target is incredibly strong when it works. Uh, the problem is they get to make the enemy gets to make a constitution saving throw and so many enemies in game have high constitution saving throws um, so they save against your dc which is proficiency bonus plus, well eight plus proficiency bonus plus wisdom bonus right so it's only a 14 for us right now not amazing if the enemy makes the save uh, they're not stunned and your key point is gone and that's what hurts so much. Maybe refunding the key point if they make the save is too powerful. Some would argue that it is. I don't necessarily think so, but I have admitted to being biased. Um, at the very least, I wish that they would allow this to be like a wisdom saving throw or a dexterity saving throw or something other than constitution. But anyway, it is what it is. And when it works, it's amazing. So, you know, if you're up against low-ish constitution save targets, you're better off using this, obviously, for your key point than pretty much anything, including flurry of blows or hand of harm, etc. cetera. Um, but again, it all depends on if it lands. So at this point, our burst round of damage looks like this. First of all, keep in mind, you have five key points to spend right now, right? And so I'm going to assume, just for the ease of crunching numbers, that your target is stunned here when we're calculating damage, meaning that you stun them on the previous round, probably, and again, remember, it lasts until the end of your next turn, right? Or maybe, you know, your very first attack this turn and you land your stun. You, you hit them and you land your stun. I know, that's not always going to be the case. The enemy's not always going to be stunned. Sometimes you won't have key. Uh, sometimes they'll make their saving throw. Sometimes you'll go into battle and you'll stun them on your first attack and then you'll get to unload on them and it'll be awesome. You guys are smart enough that you can appreciate that the damage is going to be less, you know, when things don't go perfectly. So yes, this is a best case scenario damage report. But against a stun target, you are, uh, you're attacking twice as your action, right? And then spending a key point, flurry of blows, making two more for a total of four attacks that do a D8 plus four all you know, made at triple advantage because of elven accuracy and they're stunned. And then adding hand of harm to one of those attacks for an extra d6 plus three damage. So damage report, level six. In this one round of burst damage, we are going to, against an enemy with a 10 armor class, do 44 damage per round, damage in that round, I should say. And against an enemy with a 15 armor class, it's 42 damage. And admittedly, for a character that's supposed to be doing Nova damage or burst damage, that's not amazing. But it is going to get a lot better very quickly. Um, and you can heal. You have 45 feet of move speed. You can catch arrows with your bare hands. You can potentially stun a target for an entire round. You can jump off of cliffs that are 60 feet tall. And your sustained damage isn't terrible. So, you know, still a viable, fun character to play that does okay burst damage middling sustained damage and has lots of other cool fun abilities to, to, to do. I'm not complaining. All right, so 
we have a few key points. We have extra attack. Um, we've got some cool monk features. And we have stunning strike, very importantly. I think it's time to work on finding ways to make that burst round of damage uh, more bursty. So at level seven, we are going back to fighter. We're gonna go fighter two for the obvious action surge that everybody knows and loves. Obviously, we get to use this uh, once per short rest, and when we use our action surge, it gives us an additional action that turn. And that's amazing and incredibly powerful. So, you know, at this point now, our Nova round gets a lot better because we're making six attacks in a single turn, right? We're action, two attacks, action surge, two more attacks, and then unarmed strikes, flurry of blows, right? Key point, etc., etc. So we're making six attacks, which is way, way better. It's like kick, knee, fist, headbutt, elbow, kick. That feels like a cool kung fu master, indeed. At level eight, we are a fighter three, and we get to choose our martial archetype, our subclass. And I want to go battle master. I want to do something similar here that I did with the needler, actually. Um, we were already two levels in, right, to fighter, so picking up some maneuvers here is a really great way to improve both our utility and our team play, but also our burst damage potential. Um, so at level three, battle masters get to learn three maneuvers, right? <laughs> what are you, a tank, Amanda? Um, which enhance an attack in some way. Uh, you can only use one maneuver per attack, but there's nothing limiting you from using multiple maneuvers in a single turn. You just you can only use one per attack. So if you have multiple attacks, you can use one maneuver per each of those attacks, right? Until you run out of superiority dice, because uh, you have four superiority dice that are D8, and basically they are used to fuel those extra attacks. And when all four of those D8s have been used, when you've used up your superiority dice, then you have to wait until a short rest before they come back to you, right? So you're gonna to wanna to pick up some maneuvers that, uh, that will do extra damage plus do other cool things. And I have two favorites that I want to recommend here. Um, so trip attack and menacing attack. Now, trip attack. Trip attack is maybe the most important, I think. It tells us that when we hit a creature with a weapon attack, and again, our unarmed strikes should qualify for this, but just in case they don't and your dungeon master wants to argue with you and say they don't, that's fine, you know, use a quarter staff. It's, it's, it's okay. But we can expend uh, one of those D8 superiority dice uh, and add that damage to the attack and then force the creature that we hit to make a strength saving throw. And if they fail the strength saving throw, they are knocked prone. I wish it were a dexterity saving throw. Come on, wizards. It should be a dexterity saving throw, and you know it. Anyway, our, our difficulty check, our DC here that they make the save against, uh, wonderfully is uh, affected by either our strength or our dexterity, and we get to choose. So that's really nice. So right now, um, that's a 15 and it's gonna be, you know, 16 very soon. So what's nice about this is obviously we make the attack. If it hits, we can then decide to make it a trip attack, roll that D8, add the damage, and try and force the saving throw. And if they succeed on the saving throw, there's no reason, as far as I know, I'm sure you'll correct me if I'm wrong, that we couldn't then say, okay, then I wanna spend a key point to try and stun them. Right, because again, both of those things, the trip attack and the stunning strike tell us that after we make an attack, we can blah, 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 or blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and, and there's nothing that says you couldn't try to do both, right? Again, as far as I know. So we try and trip them. If that fails, then we could try and stun them. And if that fails, then we're going to curse the dice and the D&D &D gods and the people who made monks. <laughs> and we'll play on and everything will be okay. So of course, if you trip them, you knock them prone, now melee attacks have advantage on targets that are prone, and so our elephant accuracy kicks in just like it would if the target were stunned. Admittedly, stun is stronger, but stun costs a key point, um, but still, at least we've got a choice. And if you feel pretty confident that they have a higher strength save, maybe save your, your uh, maneuver your superiority die and try and stun them if you're relatively confident that 
their con save is better than their strength save, try and trip them. Or you could try and do both, right? As for the other maneuver that I'd recommend, Menacing Attack, um, that's fantastic. It, it also sp spends a superiority die for extra damage when you make an attack, but then they have to make a Wisdom saving throw, which is much better for us, for most monsters, or they are feared, meaning that they have disadvantage on ability checks and attack rolls, and they can't willingly move closer to you. Again, all of this so long as you are in their line of sight. And that lasts until the end of your next turn, which is great, and it will really help with uh, the survivability of your entire party. You know, I'm kind of surprised, actually, that I haven't combined a Battlemaster with a Monk up until now. Frankly, I, I feel like it's a perfect fit for a martial arts master to have all of these cool trip attacks, push attacks, reposts, parries. I mean, you're, you're waxing on, you're waxing off, you're sanding the floor, you're tripping them, you're making tons of attacks in, in a turn, especially when you've got action surge up. And it just adds another level of awesome to my Kung Fu master fantasy. At level 9, we're going war block. <laughs> war block. <laughs> At level 9, we're going warlock. I know, and guess what? We're even going hexblade. Sit down. I haven't done any levels in hexblade in any build since my Windrunner build two months ago. And before that, it was like f one in four months. Sit down. Sit down. Here's the thing. Warlocks, ugh, they give us so much for a single level dip. So much. What we need most for, for this machine gun round of, of burst damage, right, is, is some great ways to add damage to every single attack that we make. Because we're getting six of them. And a single level in Hexblade gives us not one, but two sources of extra damage on every single attack for a burst round of damage anyway. And and it's just, it's a no brainer for a single level dip. And totally worth the 13 charisma requirement in my mind. So let's talk about what we get. At level one, Warlock, we get packed magic, we get to cast spells, right? We only get one, one spell slot, one first level spell slot. It does reset on a short rest though. And I'm sure you know what spell I'm taking. Uh, yes, it's Hex. And you know, Hex tells us that as a bonus action, um, we curse a target, and then we get to do an extra d6 of damage every time we hit it with an attack. We also, as part of Hex, you get to choose an ability, and then they have disadvantage with skill checks of that chosen ability, which is nice. If they die as a bonus action, we can transfer it to another target. It requires concentration. That's why we wanted a proficiency in our constitution saving throws, especially. Um, it lasts for an hour. Obviously, an extra d6 of damage per hit is nice, especially when you're making six hits in a turn, potentially. So we also get Hexblade Warrior. Hexblade's Warrior, which really does nothing for us. It gives us proficiency in medium armor, shields, and martial weapons, none of which we will use. Unless you really want to use like a rapier now for, for a monk weapon, which again, thanks to Tasha's, we could do. But um, the best ability for our purposes here uh, that we get is Hexblade's Curse. I don't actually love Hexblade's Curse on when, I, when I'm making sustained damage builds because you, you, as a bonus action, curse a target and then you get to do damage uh, equal to your proficiency bonus every time you attack them, every time you hit them, sorry. And that's great, but it's only one target per short rest and that just is hard to consider sustainable, right? Um, but for a burst damage build, that's fantastic. I, I guess I should put an asterisk in there that once you hit level 14 in Hexblade, you can transfer that curse as a bonus action. Um, so that is a little more sustainable on it, but I haven't done, I haven't done a, a, a build that takes 14 levels in Hexblade since my yin-yang team-up build, I think, a few months ago. But anyway, uh, the target has to be within 30 feet of you, you have to be able to see them, and also you crit on them when you get a 19 or a 20, and that's great, and then extra damage, and then if they die, you heal a little bit. So, okay, let's address the elephant in the room here. We obviously have a bonus action conflict here, right? Hex requires a bonus action. Hexblade's Curse requires a bonus action. And uh, Flurry of Blows, obviously, requires a bonus action. <sighs> it's really too bad, in my opinion, that you can't decide to 
spend your action to use a second bonus action if you really wanted to. Um, I know that that's not how wizards balanced the abilities in the game, so we can't. But anyway, I wish we could. So yes, Hex and Hexblade's Curse especially require a bonus action, and our goal is to eliminate a target as quickly as possible. So, you know, are you really going to assume that the target is both hexed and cursed um, before you jump into combat with them and try and blow them up? Um, yeah, I am. You know, obviously, if you can somehow try to get either Hex or Hexblade's Curse off before combat starts, that's going to be great. Otherwise, you know, sure, you're not going to be able to do this every time. It might even be infrequent that you get to have a target that is both Hexed and Cursed, right? And then you unload with your Action Surge and your Flurry of Blows and blah 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 for six attacks doing tons of damage, right? Yes, it's best case scenario. It's not always going to work. But again, as I've said many times in previous videos, I, I am interested in exploring the limits of what's possible, right? And and essentially leave it to you guys to figure out, well, okay, I need to scale this back or I need to temper my expectations. You know, no, you're not necessarily going to be blowing all of your superiority dice to use all of your combat maneuvers in a single turn, right? Your team might be much better served with you spreading those out and moving people around the battlefield with your combat maneuvers or doing other things, right? And, and that's okay. You might be spending your key points to, you know, not necessarily pile on damage, but use your hand of healing occasionally to bring your enemies back up from, from being unconscious, etc., etc., etc. You know, yeah, sure, against a big bad at the end of a story arc that's going to take a few rounds to kill, you could conceivably, you know, turn one hex, make a couple of attacks, turn two hex blades curse, make a couple more attacks, and then on turn three, try to trip them, stun them, well, you're stunning them in the previous round maybe, and, you know, action surge and unloading and doing lots of big damage. Um, it's not going to work every time, but... You guys are smart, you can figure out how to adjust these numbers, right? But let's explore the possible. So, damage report at level 9. Against an enemy with a 10 armor class, assuming best case scenario that they're stunned, hexed, and cursed, or tripped at least, hexed, and cursed, um, your damage against that target would be an average of 139. And that's really nice. And against an enemy with an AC of 16, it's uh, almost just as good thanks to elven accuracy it's 134 damage so that's triple last time we checked we've gone from and and we've gone from last place uh in in the sort of comparison chart that i have check the video description for the graph um, but you will see that uh, at level six we were bottom of the barrel compared to other burst damage builds that I've done, and we've gone all the way to the top of the class in three short levels. Um, just by a nose, but still, uh, that is that is much more like it. Mercy does not exist in this dojo, does it? No, sad say. So you've picked up two extra attacks and three ways to add damage um, to every or almost every attack, right? Because like I say, we are, um, we're, we're blowing our, I'm assuming that you're blowing your superiority dice on, on maneuvers with at least four of the attacks that you're making in that burst round, right, of six. So this is really the height of this build's glory for burst damage anyway, and is thus far at this point what I would consider to be sort of the core of this build. So let's pause for a moment before we continue and discuss what I think are three different paths to take from here. On the one hand, if I really wanted to just push the limits of my burst damage potential, you're going to get a lot more mileage out of going back to fighter or warlock um, for the rest of the way. Well, fighter would get more ability score increases and in feats, they'd get more and better superiority dice, and eventually they'd get a third attack when they take the attack action, and that's uh, hard to compete with as a monk. Warlocks, on the other hand, would get some nice invocations, um, they'd get a little pet specter, and ultimately spirit shroud spell to replace hex, which um, starts off only as a 1d8 per attack, but eventually you'd be able to upcast it to 2d8 
per attack. Not to mention, you know, greater power, utility, and versatility thanks to the other spells that you could pick up along the way. And, and here is the problem with comparing my builds to one another. <laughs> I'm never going to stop doing this, but it does really incentivize me, right, to try to push whatever it is that I'm, that I'm calculating for on every character and not necessarily make them particularly well-rounded. And I get that that's a, a criticism that some of you may have. Of course, I want every single one of my builds to grow up big and strong. They're like my children and I, and I don't want them to feel bad when they're compared to their brothers and sisters on a graph. <laughs> so very quickly, let's take a quick look at who wins the burst damage fight um, at level 17 if you were to go the fighter route or the warlock route, right? So a fighter at level 17 here, um, if we just continued to add fighter levels, by level 17 they would get 8 attacks in that burst round of damage. Um, 5 of them would potentially get a d10 of superiority die. Um, then they'd still get the d6 for hex, uh, 6 damage for hexblade's curse, a d6 plus 5 for hand of harm, and against an enemy with a 10 armor class you would do 211 damage, and against an enemy with an 18 armor class you'd do 205. That's a lot, and it's competitive with other burst damage builds that I've done. The Warlock route, on the other hand, you would only get six attacks, um, only four of them with, you know, a d8 superiority die still, but then every attack would get a 2d8 of damage um, from Spirit Shroud, and you wouldn't have to use a bonus action to transfer it, at, you know, from target to target. That's just inherent on you, and when you make an attack, you do that damage, right? Still get six damage from Exploit's Curse on your target, um, you get a d6 plus 4 for your Hand of Harm, and again, and and if we throw in your Spectre, assuming that you have your Spectre and that they're helping you out and fighting against an enemy with a 10 armor class, it's 221 damage, and against an 18, it's 211. So, Advantage Warlock. I actually was surprised by that. Um, but yes, Advantage Warlock, and you're probably just going to get more versatility from Warlock spells and things. So if it were me, and I were just trying to really maximize my damage, my burst damage potential, um, at the expense of everything else, I think I'd go Warlock, Hexblade, the rest of the way. But this is supposed to be a Mercy Monk build, not a Hexblade build with Mercy Monk levels, right? And... I love monks, and there's more to this game than DPR, people. Have I taught you nothing? Have I, have I created this rope that I'm now hanging myself with? <laughs> but for reals, we're, we're not going to get a lot more burst damage from the Mercy Monk. We'll get a little, but if we're being honest, the Fighter Path and the Warlock Path, those damage bumps that they do get come very, very late. And so you're really not going to see a lot of damage increase from them either until you get to like level 16, 17. So I'm actually going to approach this much like I did um, the Spore Beast build. Oh boy, I'm probably out of cards, so sorry if nothing actually shows up there. And that is, uh, you know, to to have created something that that is very powerful in combat and then halfway through your career make a shift towards something that is a little more well-rounded. And let's be honest, monks shouldn't just be focused on killing things, right? That doesn't sound very monkish. So I want to explore the merciful aspect of the mercy monk at this point. So let's embrace both the yin and the yang here. I think it would be a lot of fun, really, and I talked about this in the Spore Beast build, to, to sort of give your character a new focus during combat. Well, to give them a new focus or, or more things and new things and better things and other things to do, right, other than just hit stuff. Or in our case, you know, we'll have this one big nuclear round of, of combat where we just do a ton of damage, hopefully kill a target outright, and then we get to spend the rest of combat still still peppering enemies with damage, but also debuffing them and healing and buffing our allies, or at least, you know, curing them and things like that. Um, and I think it would just, it would really give us a way to act in combat that's fun, that's versatile, that's super mobile. So let's do that. Let's explore that avenue now with this build. So at level 10, we're monk six. We get key empowered strikes. 
and now our unarmed strikes can overcome magical resistance or you know resistance to non-magical attacks that monsters have um you might have needed this sooner so feel free to take monk six earlier if uh, if you're running into a lot of monsters that have you know resistance to non-magical attacks our move speed goes up by five feet so now we have a 50 feet move speed which is awesome and then we get the physician's touch feature i love 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 this feature so when you use hand of healing um, you can also and not instead of but also heal and cure a disease on the target that you touch again that can be yourself or the blind condition deafened paralyzed poisoned or stunned condition um, that is really nice on your turn you get to do some damage and it will be okay damage i mean it's a you know you'll be making three attacks if you're doing flurry of blows and then using one of them for hand of healing you're still getting three attacks for a d8 of damage plus your dex obviously plus uh, d6 um, assuming hex is up and healing someone and potentially curing them of a disease or a fairly crippling condition um, that's some class a support right now or maybe a minus or B plus at least, right? I'm not saying you should spend all of your key points doing this every turn, but when it's needed, it will be an awesome to have. And also, Physician's Touch gives us uh, this feature, which is when you use your Hand of Harm on a creature for that extra damage, you can subject them to the poison condition. You just poison them. There's no saving throw, there's no roll, they're just poisoned. Obviously, if they have immunity to poisoned, which a lot of monsters do have, uh, it won't work, but otherwise, that's fantastic, right? Poisoned creatures have disadvantage on attacks and ability checks. It lasts until the end of your next turn. And you could just continue to do this so long as you had key points. You could keep someone permanently poisoned and permanently at disadvantage on their attacks. That's some really nice survivability for your party. At level 11, we are a monk 7, and we get evasion. Um, for those who don't know, evasion is pretty cool. It uh, basically allows us to, if we are making a dexterity saving throw, in order to avoid taking damage from a spell or something that requires a dex save, uh, then if we succeed on the save, we take zero damage instead of half, and if we fail the save, we still just take half damage. Really, really nice for probably the most common uh, you know, save or take damage spells that enemies are going to throw at you. You also have Stillness of Mind, so you use your action and you can end the Charmed or Frightened condition on yourself. So between this and your Physician's Touch, you'll be able to end most negative statuses, right? At least on yourself, and that's really powerful. At level 12, we're a Monk 8, and we finally get another ability score increase or feat. And I know I want I want both dexterity and wisdom really bad. And instead, I'm going to say that we should take the mobile feat. Um, I, I took something that did not increase my numbers on the graph. What is the world coming to? But you know what's crazy? I have never taken the mobile feat on a character in one of my builds before. I know, that's nuts. Here's the thing. Even though we can disengage for a bonus action and a key point uh, as a monk, most of the time when we really want to disengage, it's because we're going to want to use our hand of healing and or physician's touch to, to help a friend. And the best way that we can do that, of course, is to use your bonus action for flurry of blows so that we can get some extra damage and maybe even apply a stun condition or a poison condition on an enemy or both and then go heal and cure our ally right but of course as i mentioned before unless we're killing our target you know we're probably going to take an attack of opportunity when we when we run away to try and go heal our friend so we want the mobile feat it gives us an extra 10 feet of move speed, which is awesome. So now we have 60 feet of move speed. That's as much as most characters when they dash. When we do dash, we'd have 120 feet of move speed, but difficult terrain doesn't slow us down. And most importantly, if you make a melee attack against an enemy, you don't provoke an opportunity attack from them for the rest of the turn. Whether you hit or not, you just have to make the attack, right? So that's perfect. And remember here, if you're surrounded by, let's say, up to three enemies, you could, you know, action, make an attack against one, action, still make an attack against the second, bonus action, flurry of blows, 
third attack against the third, and then get away scot-free for your second flurry of blows to Hand of Healing Physician's Touch, <laughs> a downed ally, or poisoned or stunned ally, right? And also, since we're not super tanky, right? We don't have a really high constitution. Our armor class is only a 17 at this point, unless we've managed to pick up, you know, bracers of defense or cloak or ring of protection or something like that. Um, getting in, hitting, healing, maybe poisoning, stunning, whatever, and getting out is going to be our MO, our modus operandi. Um, and very easy to do now with this feat and all of our move speed. At level 13, we're a monk nine. And we get an unarmored movement improvement that allows us to run up vertical surfaces and across liquids. And it's just one of my very favorite things in all of D&D. And it's, and it's so little utilized. <laughs> I will say it every time. DMs, please give us some important walls to run up and more importantly, some very important ponds or rivers or lakes to run across. Thank you, sincerely, monks. Um, level 13 damage report. So against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would be doing in that burst round 145 damage on average. And against an enemy with a 17 armor class, it's 140. Um, not much different than last time. The only thing affecting our damage that's increased since the last check is an increase of one to our proficiency bonus. But hey, even though we are falling behind the other burst damage builds now at this level, 140-ish um, damage in a single round is nothing to sneeze at. And we've picked up some really nice support features in lieu of more damage. And to be fair, the fighter and warlock paths don't actually look that much better at this point either, um, but they don't get our cool support and monkish features, so meh. At level 14, we are a monk 10. Um, our move speed goes up by five more feet, so that's 65 feet of move speed now, and 130 if we dash, which we can do for a key point as a bonus action. Uh, we get purity of body, which makes us immune to disease and poison, and that's nice. It's slightly less nice when we have a very easy way to cure it on ourselves, but hey, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Um, level 15, we are a monk 11. Our martial arts die goes to a 1d8, and that will have some implications for us, um, but among other things, it means that our hand of healing and hand of harm go up a little bit in the damage and the healing that they do. And then we get this really cool feature called Flurry of Healing and Harm. So now, both of your Flurry of Blows unarmed strikes can be used instead for Hand of Healing and not just one of them. So that's potentially 2d8 plus 6 of healing and curing per turn, you know, on two different targets potentially. Um, for the cost of only a single key point, it's not amazing, uh, for sure. But, of course, you get to do that while you also do damage and potentially stun and or poison an enemy. You have 11 key points now so per short rest, so it's a little easier to do this kind of stuff on your turn, right? If instead you use at least one of those flurry of blows for an unarmed strike, you can do the hand of harm damage and poison condition without spending a key point. So we're talking on your turn, you could potentially do three attacks for 3d8 of damage plus 3d6 of damage if they're hexed plus 12 plus 1d8 plus 3 for the hand of harm for a total of 43.5 damage on average plus making the enemy poisoned plus healing an ally or yourself for 1d8 plus 3 and curing a disease or a condition all for one key point on your turn that's pretty cool right and you can catch arrows with your bare hands and walk on water um, and run up a 160-foot cliff and jump off it and land light as a cat. Always on your feet. Come on. That's cool. At level 16, I want to go back to fighter for a minute um, and go fighter 4. I think with our martial arts die now at a d8, finally, um, the unarmed fighting style that we had is pretty redundant. So let's take a level in fighter to get an ability score increase, right, or feat. And so thanks to the martial versatility feature from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, 
we can, when we take an ASI as a fighter, replace our fighting style. So the ability score increase is going to be dexterity, you know, plus to dex, so we'll now have a 20 dex, finally. Um, I'm actually tempted to take wisdom here, to be honest. You know, both dexterity and wisdom raise our armor class, of course. Um, and while dexterity does more for our damage and initiative and things, wisdom does more for our heals, a little more for our hand of harm, but then more importantly, it raises our monk difficulty check, right? So stunning strike is more likely to stick. But we've got the trip attack. It's based on our dexterity, so I think we'll stick with dexterity. For the fighting style that we swap to, I'm gonna go with dueling, and I feel a little bit dirty about it, but because we've gone this whole time, right, without using weapons, or at least in my mind, I'm going without using weapons. And I, so I was tempted to, for the fighting style to go superior technique and pick up, uh, you know, a, another maneuver and another superiority die, even though it would only be a d6. The number cruncher inside me just couldn't resist that extra two damage per attack. Uh, when we make an attack with a weapon, you know, that we're wielding in one hand and, and you know, a lot of the attacks, just just the flurry of blows are, have to be unarmed strikes, right? The other attacks that we make can be made with the monk weapon, and thanks to the dedicated weapon feature from Tasha's that's new for monks, we could get a rapier here, uh, and we are proficient with them because of our hexblade level, right? So we could make that a monk weapon, and uh, and then we'd, we'd have the same die, the same d8 of damage, but with the dueling uh, with the dueling fighting style, we get to add two extra damage to those rapier attacks, at least. And it's not a ton, but I'm a sucker for bigger numbers, so feel free to not go that route, of course, and take superior technique, and it's not a big difference numbers-wise. It's a little less potential damage, maybe gives you a little more versatility and utility, so, you know, do what you want. But if you go that route, obviously, we want to pick up a rapier here and make it a monk weapon. So at level 17, um, going back to Monk, admittedly, uh, well, and we'd be a Monk 12, admittedly there is a very strong argument here for going Warlock 2, and in fact, if you are going to do that, I would suggest doing it a long time ago, <laughs> maybe as early as level 10, right? Because you get one, you get one more spell slot, and when they refresh on a short rest, having two instead of one is a big deal, I think. And plus you get Warlock Invocations, those are hard to pass up. Um, I just wanted to get back to monk so badly for all the monkey goodies. Um, assuming then that we stay monk here, ability score increase our feet as a monk 12. Um, I'd raise our wisdom to 18 uh, for the reasons that I stated. You know, your AC goes up, your difficulty check goes up, so that's great. Final damage report at level 17. Against an enemy with a 10 armor class, in our Nova round of damage, we would do 168 damage on average. And against an enemy with an 18 armor class, we would do 164 on average, almost the same. Um, again, this is a hexed, cursed, and stunned or tripped target, right? I appreciate that that's a perfect scenario that you're not always going to have in game. But you're doing four attacks, you're doing, you know, on, on, on four of the attacks, I should say, you're doing a D8 weapon plus a D8 maneuver plus a D6 for Hex plus five for our Dexterity plus six for Hexblade's Curse plus two for Dueling. Um, and then you get two more attacks, Unarmed Strikes, that do all of that except for the Dueling and the maneuver damage. So it's a lot of damage. It's, you know, 30 to 40% below other burst damage builds that I've done but you bring a level of support and awesomeness that they will never achieve. And, you know, even the Warlock version of this that I mentioned um, was still 10% or so below uh, those other burst damage builds anyway, so might as well go Monk and, you know, become both somebody that has strong Nova capabilities, but some good, fun utility and support functionality as well. Final thoughts? I don't have a lot to say. I've, I've talked a lot, <laughs> as I am wont to do. Um, I think this build would be so much fun to play. I love both the burst damage and the versatility and utility that it brings and the support capabilities. I love the idea of just kind of running all over the battlefield, peppering your enemies, applying conditions to them, healing your allies, and curing conditions off of them, and and just doing all of the cool, fun, monk things that you get to do while you're at it. I think it would be a blast. I think it would be uh, welcome in any party. 
and I really hope to play it sometime soon. Um, we actually recorded our session one already for the new campaign, and I think if we hadn't, <laughs> I might be rolling this character instead. So maybe it's good, because I've already done a, a, a monk to level 16 before, and uh, I've never played a Hexblade, which is what I'm doing in the new campaign, and, and, and it was a lot of fun, that session one was. Can't wait to share it with you guys. So that's the show for the week. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, as always, please like and subscribe and share, and... You know, I love you guys. Thanks so much for all that you do, and I hope that you have a fantastic day. Talk to you soon. Bye.